Hey everybody, it is Cam here. Today I'm going to talk about The Seeds of War by Jal Silva. It was published last year, uh, May of 2023. It is the first book in the Smokesmith series, comes in at 588 pages long, and it is the debut novel for Mr. Silva. Uh, real quick, before I get into uh, all my usual spiel, um, I have had several comments recently from people who tell me that they love my full and thorough uh, review style. And then I've also had some comments about people who tell me that they would prefer that they hear more about my thoughts on the book as opposed to me going quite so much detail. Well, uh, I think that the way that I do things is probably, uh, there's a lot more people that like that, um, and it's a little bit different from some of the other, uh, you know, um, book review YouTube channels. And so um, I was kind of trying to decide what to do. So uh, in speaking with another very helpful individual, uh, they said that uh, they like to see, um, you know, the full review on ones that they haven't read yet. But when they're coming to, to see my reviews that they've already read the books on, they would prefer if I just threw up a quick graphic that had the time of uh, when I'm going to go from doing, um, you know, all of the plot, the characters, all that kind of stuff, and where I'll get to my, uh, you know, my thoughts on the book and stuff. So what I'll try to do is every book review episode, uh, right off the bat, after I give my intro of, of, you know, who the author and what the book is and stuff, I will throw up on the screen the uh, timestamp, and I'll probably try to put that down in the notes as well. Um, and we'll have, uh, you know, that in there. And I will make sure that I point and mention it on the screen that I will have, uh, um, you know, where we get past quite such a detailed review and where I get more into my thoughts. With that out of the way, let's real quick go ahead and um, talk about uh, the book and the, we'll do all the usual stuff. The, the world building, the magic system is, I think, the, the strong point in this book. So I'll make sure I talk about that. That's kind of my thing anyways. Uh, then I'll talk about the characters, the bad, the good, and my final thoughts. Uh, once again, this is the debut novel for Mr. Silva, uh, and that is J-O-A-O-S-I-L-V-A. -O -O Silva is pretty easy. Uh, he's Portuguese, I believe. Um, this is his debut novel, the first book in the Smokesmith series. Uh, there is a novella already out now as well, and I think he's working on book two. Uh, this book, um, it is self-published, but it is up for a slew of indie awards right now. Uh, for, you know, debut author um, and things like that. What I um, will say is I did feel like this was a debut novel, and I'm going to talk about, um, you know, both the good, the bad, and all that kind of stuff um, here real quick. Let's go ahead and um, talk about the world first. Uh, we're almost dealing with a grim dark world here. I think that dark, gritty fantasy is is more uh, appropriate, but it, it does certainly flirts with grim dark and... Um, you know, it's kind of funny. like sometimes you have to talk like where does dark fantasy and, and true grim dark where, where are the difference? And so I feel like this flirts with that line, maybe, you know, dips its toes into grim dark, but not quite as dark as some of the other uh, series that it, just for some reason to me, it just didn't feel quite that way. Uh, we have a world that has just gotten done with a major war where like monsters were involved, like humans were fighting monsters. There are other uh you know, fan fantasy races. There's ones called the the Pineys. They uh, apparently their heads look like pine cones. They're very short. They're like four feet tall. Uh, they're green, um, and th they're different. Uh, they're definitely not human. And then we also have some uh, like basically mostly made up fantasy creatures, um, like their mounts and things like that. A uh, lot more of like a reptilian uh, feel to a lot of the, the things, kind of like how R.J. Barker creates his own, um, you know, races. One thing I really did actually appreciate was that right off the beginning of the book, there's a bestiary with some pictures and a description of what the, the different beasts are. That was very helpful because the names and what they are has really no uh, bearing on anything on Earth. And so uh, that was nice to have that right off the bat. It was certainly helpful. Um, we had a, a major war, as I mentioned, with monsters. Um, one of the main characters, Oberissus, he somehow managed to, um, through the help of this like magical orb, uh, banish those monsters, like, completely change the geography of the land, raise the continent. Uh, I'm not entirely certain how all that stuff happened. Um, I don't know that I'm supposed to like you know know exactly, but but you kind of learn as the the story goes on exactly like what happened. But um, it's funny too because like Oberessus isn't he can't like 
regularly uh, control that orb, but it's a big part of like his whole personality, as I'll talk about when I get into the characters. But um, there's also um, some other fantasy creatures that are mentioned, uh, some of the fantasy races. But for the most part, we're dealing with humans as well as those uh, um, little piney guys. Uh, politically, we're dealing with, you know, like kingdoms and things like that. But uh, we're definitely dealing with a ton of inequality. And the way that like even the magic system and all that stuff works kind of helps perpetuate that inequality and also makes it so that it's not really in the best interest of the the kings and the nobility to make things less um oppressive so let's go ahead and talk about that magic system now too while we're doing this so the um the book is called the smokesmith the magic system is based on um it, it's a smoke magic basically the way that most people become smokesmiths is that the rulers of the kingdoms will actually like round up street urchins every once in a while orphans whoever and they'll put them in a room and they'll light this special like incense, these special herbs, and they'll light them on fire and, you know, force the, the kids to inhale them. The ones that survive it, very rare, most of them die. Uh, those ones will then be trained as smokesmiths. And so every time that you want to use your smoke powers, you'll have to like burn these herbs. There's different kinds of herbs or different strains. Think of it, I guess, kind of like marijuana where there's different strains and some strains are better for certain people and some other ones for others. And it is talked about a little bit in the book. But what will happen then is that uh, if you do survive, every time you inhale that smoke, it, it can potentially hurt you too. So most smokesmiths don't live to be, you know, more than like 40 or 50 maybe. And what will happen is, is, you know, you inhale that, that smoke and then you're going to get some magical powers. For some people, it's going to be different. One thing that was funny is, is it was, they, they said that special powers are very rare. Um, and, and what I mean is that, is that like all smokesmiths can, can light people on fire. They can like become kind of like ethereal and move around. They're really, you know, like their true like superhero weapons of war kind of thing but certain people so one of the main characters is called red now his special abilities he basically turns into like a monster now uh, he gets bigger his skin turns to like i guess stone or steel or something and and basically swords and and weapons can't hurt him and then he goes through and you know like rampages there's another one that can turn himself into like a fire tornado uh, it's supposed to be like pretty rare that they have these. And the one of the complaints I would have is that it seems like every person that, you know, our main characters interact with or have to deal with who's a smokesmith, they all seem to have that special ability, even though it's mentioned that it's very rare that someone is going to have more than just the regular smokesmith powers. And so, um, you know, it's kind of, it was something that I, I was like, I, that was, it was something that I thought about at, a couple of times when I'm like, it says it's rare, but everybody that we that uh, our main character and their bodyguard fight has one of those abilities, and it just seemed funny that you know so many of them did. I I thought they were really cool. I will say that it was just something that were when they say it's rare, and then you know there's like five or six people that they fight right off the bat that that all have that special ability. It seemed like it maybe wasn't quite so rare. There are three point of view characters. Uh, Gimlor is the first one. She is a single mother. She has a nickname of the Viper, which seems to be pretty infamous. She's actually on that uh, new continent that was created. She has tried to create like a town where outcasts and outlaws and things like that can go to. That right off the bat, though, she's already dealing with some issues with the kingdom that Oberessus kind of gets himself involved with because she has created this elixir that makes people superhuman and they're able to fight smokesmiths because of that ability. They also are able to, you know, just be a lot more powerful than they would be. I guess it has healing powers as well. Although it, from what I've seen so far, you know, at the beginning is at least it doesn't, it seems like it's more just like you become inhuman and, you know, you fight to, to the last drop of blood. And so everybody else is going to want this. Gimlor doesn't have any sort of kingdom surrounding her. She's only got a few hundred people and the, uh, you know, the land that she's got with, with her creatures that, that she uses to create this potion. And so her issues right off the bat are that there are colonists from another place that are coming in and they're, you know, threatening her. And so she's going to have to figure out what she's going to do about that. 
She, as I mentioned, is a single mother. Her kids kind of seem like they're in the 10 to 12-ish age range at this point now. And, um, you know, she's always worried about what's going to happen and whether, um, you know, she's going to keep her people safe. And she's not exactly beloved by all of her people anyways. Our second main character is Oberessis. I think I'm saying that right, O-B-E-R-I-S-I-S. And he is the person who actually somehow managed to raise that continent and banish those monsters before, you know, the book started. He was a poor, petty thief in uh, the two kingdoms, which how they're kind of involved is they're the ones that are sending those colonists over. And at this point, though, he's dealing with just debilitating migraines um, on a regular basis, and he's trying to figure out a way to... Um, you know, get those stopped, and that's kind of why he's wanting to get that elixir, because he's hoping it's going to heal him. He uh, actually, like, portrays himself as a god, and he has a holy movement going. He's probably, you know, he feels like a fraud at all times, but he is trying to get those, uh, you know, that elixir and, and figure out how he's going to get a hold of it. He gets himself involved with the, the court of that, the two kingdoms of two nations, and that's how he's going to, you know, eventually be involved I really liked him. I think he was my favorite character. I liked, you know, he knows he's a fraud for the most part. But, I mean, he really did do uh, what he, you know, what he said he's, he did. It's just that he can't control that orb anymore, and it certainly doesn't help him on a regular basis like he would like. And the way that the cult of personality that he's created, he can't show that he has these migraines and stuff, right? He doesn't think that a god would, should be having pain and things like that. Then our third uh, point of view character is Rednow. Rednow is in his 60s. He's a smokesmith. He's the one I mentioned that has the, the ability to like basically become a monster. And so he, he, uh, he's almost uh, to the point where using the herbs is going to kill him. Like Every single time he uses the herbs, he coughs up blood, and he's in really rough shape. But he's the head of this mercenary band called the Leith. And he saves, uh, you know, street urchins and tries to, to stop them from being taken and, and be made smokesmiths. And so he trains those street urchins up. And then once they get older, then, you know, they become part of his mercenary band. His big worry is that at this point, we're just starting to get uh, guns now and gunpowder weapons. And now you, you combine that with that elixir that Gimlor's made and he's worried that, that his military force, his, his mercenaries, who are uh, widely um, accepted as the best fighters in, in the known world, and he's worried that they're going to become obsolete and you know all these people that he helps on a regular basis are no longer going to be safe because of that. So his worry and how he's going to be you know, kind of getting involved with Gimlor is he finds a vial of that. Um, that elixir and and so eventually everyone's all going to be tied together based around wanting that elixir or being worried about it or something like that right uh that's kind of the whole the plot right there is that you know everybody wants the elixir or is worried about the elixir or something like that and Gimlor is worried that uh, that her little enclave and her you know kids and stuff are going to be wiped out because of that um now, getting into the, the bad, the good, and my final thoughts. So now with the bad, there's a couple things that I, I really felt like this book could have done a better job of. The first one is that I really feel like this book needed more editing. I, I, I don't personally think that this book was quite ready. And I don't mean that there's grammatical errors or formatting errors or anything like that. Uh, I just felt like the book wasn't tight enough. It's 588 pages long. I think that despite it being like a super cool epic fantasy with a lot of awesome world building, it still could have been like 480, right? Like, I think that there's just too much description um, and it takes place within a character's head. And it really bugged me at times. At times it took me out of that movie in my mind where... We're, we're going along, and I think Gimlor was probably the character who I felt was the most guilty of this, but she does a ton of the world building worrying about things in her own mind and describing things that I don't feel like a person would naturally describe. I, I wish there would have been another character, like one of her underlings, who she was telling these things to or having a back and forth with 
where they're, you know, like worrying about these things. But instead, she's describing things in a level of detail that even I, who regularly, you know, have stories in my mind, uh, this is kind of embarrassing, but when I can't fall asleep, I'll just create stories in my mind. Sometimes it'll be, you know, new individual ones, or for years and years, it was a separate wheel of time stories of like after, you know, all that stuff. And so it's just, um, even I don't think I went into that level of detail when I was thinking of world building in my mind at times, right? And I feel like that that's the kind of thing that that maybe a little bit, um, you know, more work would have um, would have tightened up and wouldn't have had quite so much of, of that world building happening within a character's head. Now, like Oberesis, I feel like he also does a lot of that world building in his head. But even among his followers, though, he has to, you know, basically be a god. So I felt like it was more appropriate when it was happening within his own mind, as opposed to like with Gimlor or even Red now, where, you know, he's thinking about and, and telling us, but in his own mind, right, of like how the, the Leith Mercenary Company got formed, all of these things. It's just way more description than I think should have happened within a character's mind. Now, that's a personal preference right there, right? Uh, this book is up for multiple awards, and it's a finalist for several. So clearly, you know, a lot of people weren't bugged by that in the same way that I was. The reason that I, that I read this book in the first place is that several other booktubers who, uh, you know, I like, generally, if they like a book, then I'll like a book. They had glowing reviews of this book, and so, you know, Obviously, this is an issue more with me, but it's just something that I felt like maybe if it had been tightened up just a little bit more and um, that I would have felt like it was more flowing and it wouldn't have occasionally gotten me out of that movie in my mind. And basically, I think that if we'd have just had an extra character or like an underling who was already, you know, in the, the story, if they'd have just been, you know, talking to them, I think it would have felt better to me. Because the dialogue was very good. I didn't feel like, you know, there was any issue with the dialogue when, when that was happening. I just, you know, personal preference issue here. Uh, now, as far as the good goes, uh, this book had some amazing world building. It really did. And I feel like it was done very, very well. And I really could imagine it. I kind of imagined it in my mind a little bit like a video game. That if you were that you would be especially like Gimlor's town where you'd be walking through, uh, there's lots of reds. Uh, the hues, you know, aren't quite the same as is on Earth as far as what I imagined it. It was swampy, but I kind of imagined more like reds. And I and I at this moment I can't remember if that's how it, the grasses were described or if that's just <laughs> the way it came up in my own mind. Uh, I'll have to go back and look to see if you know this was something that I just created randomly myself. But I really did kind of I could really envision, especially that the town that Gimlor created and the swamps and the way they you know had created their their um, their farms that they call them where they're farming um, you know animals. And it, it's just I really felt like he did a really good job of describing the towns, you know everything. There's lots of squalor and then you know the palaces that are they're opulent. And I felt like that was done really, really well. I also did like all three of the characters. And while I might not have liked how much time they spent in their heads, I, I felt like they were all characters that um, really added something to the story, all three of them. Uh, my favorite was definitely Oberesis. I thought that, you know, even like his internal dialogue, I felt fit better. And I liked how, you know, he, he even he feels like a fraud, even though he really did do what he was supposed to supposed to have done. But, you know, now that he can't control this orb that he, that he carries, then, you know, he's always got to worry because he can't perform miracles regularly for his growing flock. And he, you know, still wants to, to maintain that, that silence while uh, trying to figure out how to cure himself. Then uh, Red Now, I think Red Now was probably a character that I was the most neutral on. Uh, I liked him, but, you know, he was in his 60s. He uh, spends a lot of time worrying about his legacy. And then Gimlor... I just felt like I didn't care for the way the the internal dialogue happened with her as much, uh, but she still was a good character. Uh, the one thing, though, I felt like maybe at times sh she interacted, like during a fight scene, for having been a um, you know a mercenary captain as well of her own, basically, or more of a bandit captain, I guess, not true mercenary. She does you know freak out during a battle, but I guess it, it was you know gunpowder was involved and where that's the first time she's really had to face gunpowder. 
So all in all, though, I really like the world building. The magic system's awesome. Uh, the whole Smokesmith thing, I really like that both, you know, same thing as kind of like how with Plague of Giants, there's a big um, risk of, uh, you know, most people die to, you know, the first time they inhale the smoke. And then also the more you use it, you know, the, the sooner you're going to die, basically. So now into my final thoughts is that this one is one where I kind of feel like that this is another book that I could absolutely see Orbit picking up at some point since they, you know, they're the ones that I think feel like do the best job of picking up these uh, indie authors. And in some ways, it reminds me a little bit of the uh, Aiden saga from Justin Lee Anderson in terms of like the feel of the book, you know, uh, just about grimdark, but not like too grimdark. And then, um, Maybe like if I, I feel like if they went in, did some more editing and tightened this book up and, you know, like I said, made it maybe like 480 pages long instead of 580 pages long, then I feel like this would be a really amazing book. And I know that he's already working on other books in the series. And so I, I think that like this is one of those that uh, if it was a trilogy or even like four or five books would really um, have, you know, its own unique world that feels really alive a really cool magic system that is that you can do a lot of things within that magic system, but it's not too complicated. It's something that, you know, could be uh, iconic to uh, Silva. And so I, I think that, you know, this is a book that I really just feel like if it was tightened up would, um, would go from um, where I'm going to rate it to like a nine or a 10. I really liked Justin, you know, Lee Anderson's work. And I don't actually know how much it was tightened up. I read the first book of his before it was picked up by Orbit, but then um, I'm about to read um, here pretty quick. The probably two books from now will be the second book in that, and then I'll actually do a full review since I just did a podcast for the first one, uh, The Lost War. But I feel like if this one was tightened up in, in my mind, right? And this is all, uh, for me, a personal preference because obviously if it's this book's up for awards, and then people like, say, Library of Viking, he's got 100,000 subscribers, and, you know, he, he really enjoys this book. There's other people that, you know, that I, that I follow that, that I regularly watch and who, you know, I think do a great job with fantasy books that like this book a lot, too. So, you know, maybe that's just a personal preference issue, and, and it doesn't need any more tightening up. But that's just the way I kind of see it. Uh, I'm going to give this one a 7 out of 10. Um, I'm going to really, um, the world building is like a 10 out of 10. The magic system is like a 10 out of 10. Um, but I just didn't necessarily like the way that the world building was done. This is why I like info dumps, uh, at, at magical schools, for example, magical schools are one of my favorite tropes in fantasy because it gives a real valid reason, you know, to be spewing out all of the, these, you know, details that, that you wouldn't necessarily think about in your own mind if you already knew them and you'd grown up with these details. Uh, like I said, a seven out of 10, I still enjoyed the book. And I have uh, actually talked to a couple people who say that the, both the prequel and um, th what's coming forward is a lot tighter. And so I'll definitely read uh, that prequel at some point here. And then when a sequel does come out, I'm, I'm gonna give that one a shot too and see what I think. Uh, once again, you know, it was his very first novel that he's written. And from what I'm told, you know, it was his first novel too. So it's not like he had 10 other novels that he'd written previously and then, you know, finally released one. And so uh, we'll see. Like I said, this one's up for a bunch of uh, award nominations already anyway. So we'll see where that goes. And um, you know what? Well, I'm excited to see where the series goes. I hope you all have a wonderful day and thanks for watching.